This is the most daunting escape route in the world, across the Himalayas on foot. It's an escape route that has operated secretly for 40 years. Tibetan refugees in flight from Chinese repression. China annexed Tibet in 1950, unchallenged by the world. Since then, Western observers believe that up to a million Tibetans, a sixth of the population, have perished through execution and starvation. This is the story of one group of escapers. From where they left the road inside Tibet, they have already walked eight days over rugged terrain, climbing up the Himalayas just to approach the border with Nepal. They have no maps, no knowledge of the route. All they own is what they carry, meager rations and their life savings. They have no specialist clothing. Pasang, aged 19, and his brother Tenzin, aged 11, have been captured before by Chinese border police. They tortured him. They tortured me as well. They poked an electric baton in my face, in my mouth like this. The Chinese do not treat Tibetans like human beings, but like cattle. They are not frightened of hurting people. If you try to escape, they will shoot you. The brothers survived. Now they're trying again to escape. Pema is a 20-year-old city waitress, prepared to leave her family forever. It seems such a terrible journey, but we must make it. We must bear any hardship just for the chance of seeing the Dalai Lama. Tibet's head of state and religious leader, the Dalai Lama. He and the government in exile are based in Dharamsala in northern India. The ambition of all refugees is to see him, to fulfill this hope they attempt an escape route of 1,600 miles from Tibet across the mountains. Uh, people who escape from Tibet, is it because of is it the, their is it the spirit or their determination, and also the fear, is it the, in spite of the thick snows or difficult road, is it the, I mean, I mean they try. So unfortunately, so sometimes, you see, the, uh, such as the dead body. So very sad. <laughs> Day.
day nine, the group are near Mount Everest, approaching one of the highest passes across the Himalayas. At 19,000 feet, the temperature is 20 degrees below zero. Any worsening in the weather would be fatal. They must keep moving. Already, the boy, Tenzin, is suffering from the pain of snow blindness. This is their long march to freedom, leaving behind a country turned into a Chinese prison. In Tibet today, repression is intense. Human rights and religious freedom curtailed. From a concealed camera, these are the latest pictures from a country where foreign journalists are banned. In both the countryside and in the capital, Lhasa, many Tibetans have been reduced to poverty and begging. There is continuous police and army presence, in uniform and secret. The population live under continuous surveillance. Over 100,000 Chinese troops are stationed in Tibet. International observers are refused access to prisons and detention centers. Officials in Beijing privately admit that 20% of inmates here are prisoners of conscience. Torture in Chinese prisons is routine. In 1992, after 33 years in prison and labor camps, one man smuggled torture instruments out of Tibet into India, the Buddhist monk Palden Gyatso. My feet were manacled and my fingers chained with a pair of these. These special handcuffs get tighter and tighter and I got wounds on my wrists. I was suspended from the ceiling, so now I cannot stretch my arms. I got very thin. This is the worst thing, an electric cattle prod. They use this on your body. If they press that button, your whole body will be in shock. If they do it for too long, you lose consciousness, but you do not die. If they press this button, you can die. They used all these on my body. They tortured me because I was speaking out for independence and I will continue to speak out. Many of my friends are still in prison. Monks, nuns, lay women and men. There were 145 in Drapshi prison alone when I escaped to India. When I sleep, I dream about them. Drapshi prison, one of six in Lhasa, now holds 270 prisoners of conscience, according to a recently released prisoner. Look 
A Buddhist prayer flag marks the border between China and Nepal. Although the group has passed the border, they are by no means safe. They are walking on a glacier that can suddenly throw up cracks and crevasses. Every year adds to a death toll that has never been counted. Their escape from Tibet will continue at high altitude for 120 miles across Nepal until they reach the lowlands. And now there are new dangers. If they are found by the Nepalese authorities before they are registered as refugees, they face deportation as illegal aliens and a return to the Chinese gulag. They also face harassment, robbery, extortion, even shooting at the hands of the Nepalese police. Day 11, the journey is taking its toll. All are suffering from extreme hunger, altitude sickness, and snow blindness. Rinchen, a herdsman from eastern Tibet. All day we are worried about having nothing to eat. All night we are cold and hungry. My foot has burst blisters. I'm in so much pain. I wonder whether I can stay alive. I cannot believe the suffering. Sering is a farmer, left penniless when his parents died, victims of the Chinese. It's very hard on me because the path is so difficult. My parents are dead. I have brought my mother's bone in the bag. I am carrying it with me over there. The group must reach Kathmandu, where they've heard there's a Tibetan community which could help them. Sonam, a monk seeking religious freedom outside Tibet. I think we will reach Kathmandu in eight to nine days. If we don't get there, we will die. But Kathmandu is in fact 20 days and 300 miles away. Boda, in Kathmandu, is the centre of the Tibetan community in Nepal. Lobsang Samten is a monk who escaped to exile here in 1982. He spent 20 years in a Chinese prison during the Maoist era of mass executions. In my prison, many died of natural causes and many were executed. Seven, eight, nine people would be lined up like this. Then they dig a pit. 
In the pit, there's a spear for each person. Behind them, men point guns at their heads. The main purpose is to shoot them in the head, and when they fall on the spear, they throw earth on top of them. That's what happened. In 1959, during an uprising, 87,000 Tibetans were executed. Many were buried here. These are Lhasa's killing fields. Mount Everest. Tibetans call it Chomo Langma, Mother of the Earth. This is day 12 of walking. Their route now takes them through the inhabited area of Nepal. Where there are police, the group must walk by night. It will make the journey more dangerous. Many have traveled vast distances across Tibet, a country the size of Western Europe, before climbing the Himalayas. The escape trail leads many to Kathmandu, only a staging post, before continuing to India and Dharamsala, home of the exiled Dalai Lama. The group have walked without a break for 36 hours. There was a gap in the path and I slipped down the rocks. I injured my head. I bandaged him and the blood spilled all over me. I was worried that he would die on us. This is what it's like. Just the smallest mistake and you can fall. Then it's all over. You're dead. The group have now been walking for 20 days. Kathmandu is still a week away. Stateless, hungry and exhausted, they have no idea what the future will bring. And for 11-year-old Tenzin, the greatest obstacles lie ahead. Eleven-year-old Tenzin leads the group, battered but intact, into the city. They have spent 30 days on the road.
At Boda, the monk Lobsang Samten knows that they are still in danger. Since 1990, Nepal has given no haven to refugees. The police can arrest and deport them at any time. Both their appearance and their baggage make them conspicuous. The monk directs them to the transit camp for Tibetans, a temporary sanctuary on the outskirts of the city. All are suffering from exhaustion and the after effects of altitude sickness. They are met by an official of the Tibetan government in exile. They are told that they can only stay in Kathmandu for a few days, during which their status will be assessed by the Tibetan Welfare Office and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. In 15 years, 25,000 people have crossed the Himalayas to be processed here, but not all have been allowed their freedom. The accommodation is an overcrowded shed. During the monsoon, there is a constant threat of disease. Here is their first meal for many days, and their first opportunity to reflect on their journey, why they left, what might happen to them next. Pasang has a place waiting for him in a monastery in India. He wants Tenzin to stay with him. This is the brother's second attempt to escape Tibet. On the first, they went to Lhasa to finance their escape by begging on the street. The police caught them and threw them into prison. The notorious Gutsa Detention Center, number four unit, a prison the Chinese say does not exist. Western observers estimate that two to three thousand political prisoners, including many children, have passed through here since 1987. There are no beds in the prison. Whether it's summer or winter, you have to sleep on the stone floor. People piss everywhere. We were sleeping in their urine. The food is meant to be noodles, but it is just like water. If you don't drink it, they punish you. The Chinese beat me mercilessly. I was hit on the eye. For three days I was blind. There were many older people, and they beat them severely. There were about 200 prisoners in there. I was sent out breaking rocks while my brother stayed in the prison. I wanted to escape, but I couldn't, because I would have left him behind. In the prison there was a small window through which we escaped. Then we went into town to beg for some money. 
and went to the border. The boys hitched a ride to the border town of Drum. In Drum, the police caught them without travel papers and held them at this check post. For five days, they were imprisoned here and repeatedly tortured. They put the electric button inside my mouth. It burned me badly and gave me a wound. They treated me very badly. In prison, I thought I would not be able to go to India. After release, the brothers chose the toughest escape route over the mountains. In Nepal, the processing continues relentlessly. The group know that vital decisions on their future are about to be made. Sonam, the monk, cannot return to Tibet because he is a marked man, accused of fermenting anti-Chinese feeling in his monastery. In 40 years of their occupation of Tibet, the Chinese have destroyed 2,700 monasteries. The number of monks has been reduced by 80,000. Now recruitment is state-controlled, religion must coexist with political education. They send a letter saying, don't run away, so all have to attend. When they come to the monastery, at the start of the meeting, the Chinese say, you are not allowed to say free Tibet. If you revolt, it's not good, they say. Concerning the Dalai Lama's demand for Tibetan independence, do not support this separatism. If you support this, we will confront you with arms and kill you. And some of us from the monastery went at night and put up posters saying, Free Tibet. The next day, three or four jeeps arrived at our monastery. Who put up posters? Do you want to be killed? They interrogated me. Is it you who put up the poster? I said, no, it's not me. They took me to prison and I know they wanted to kill me. Shortly after his interrogation, Sonam put on peasant's clothes and escaped. He is now able to resume his identity as a monk. He can wear again the robes he carried over the mountains. A medical team gives each new arrival a health check and an inoculation against tuberculosis. Pema worked in a restaurant in Lhasa. She was apolitical in Tibet until she came into confrontation with the Chinese authorities. Throughout central Lhasa, the police closely monitor citizens with video cameras and high-powered microphones. Any protest can be swiftly intercepted. On the day of a demonstration, Pema was swept up in the crowd as she left a cinema with her friends. When we got there, the Chinese police were chasing people with electric batons. There was a policeman standing nearby and we threw a stone at him. Then we were chased. We ran away. I was left behind. I fell and was arrested. Pema was held here in the Barkor police station, but was rescued by her family and taken home. 
My maternal uncle wouldn't speak to me. He said, I'm a government official. How can I now work for the government? What will happen to us if other people hear what you have done? My uncle said that he might even have to go to prison. My mother said, you don't know what this Tibetan independence means. If you do not understand something, you must not join in. It was then that Pema began secretly planning to escape from Tibet. She told no one, not even her mother. She will know by now. I wrote her a letter when I left. Before that, she had no idea. The group are now nearing the end of the processing in Nepal. Most receive their crucial passes. But Pasang and his brother, Tenzin, are singled out for special attention. The representative of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees is the officer who decides if they receive international refugee status. Their decision is based on a confidential interview. If successful, each is given a pass and sufficient money to cross the border to India. The commission has a procedural problem with Tenzin. The officers cannot understand his dialect. Only Pasang can translate for him. UN rules do not allow them to be interviewed together. They may be sent back to Tibet. They are calling us Mongolians. Sometime in the past the place where we live was in Mongolia, but now it is in Tibet. There are many like us who have been sent on to my monastery in India, but they will not send us on, and I don't know why. I don't understand what they are doing. The United Nations people have given us nothing. Although I smile sometimes, I am very unhappy in my mind. I am very angry, but what can I do? The rest of the group have their passes and money and prepare to leave for India. Pasang decides that he and Tenzin should leave with the group illegally and cross the border without papers or money. Once more, they are on the run. The Indian border is 12 hours away. At the Nepal-India border, the Tibetan refugees present customs officers with a small bribe and their papers are not checked. They are allowed to continue. Pasang and Tenzin cross the border as illegal aliens. Two days later, the refugees arrive at Delhi, the capital of India. Here, they have to change buses for Dharamsala and the Dalai Lama.
As India is attempting to limit the flow of Tibetan refugees, the prospect of deportation hangs over the two brothers. Twelve hours north of Delhi, they near Dharamsala in the foothills of the Himalayas. This is where the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government have been exiled for over 30 years. Seven thousand Tibetan refugees have crowded into Dharamsala. So the government in exile has adopted a new policy to discourage their own refugees from staying in India. It is struggling to support them and work and accommodation are scarce. In 1993, 5,000 new arrivals from Tibet were registered here. In 1994, only 2,000. All refugees are carefully checked. In recent years, many have been suspected of being Chinese agents. The papers from Nepal are inspected. Without papers, refugees will be returned to Tibet. Tenzin has no papers. Kijishimdu As he has no papers, I cannot go to the monastery. Without papers either from Nepal or here, we can't go anywhere. I am helpless. Because he can't go to the monastery, I won't be able to go there either. This is impossible.
At a celebration for the anniversary of the Tibetan school in Dharamsala, the group have their first chance to see their leader. His Holiness the Dalai Lama. All who escape from Tibet into India will receive an audience with the living Buddha of compassion. For Pasang and Tenzin, he is the highest authority. Then comes a bitter twist to the Dalai Lama's message. He warns the refugees that though they can receive education in India, he wants them to return to Tibet. He knows there is the risk of Chinese reprisals. But without their return, the country's culture will die, the land will be lost. <laughs> This is Pasang's last chance to help Tenzin stay in India. He and the official describe Tenzin's plight. The Dalai Lama gives his order. Tenzin can stay. <laughs> Sering asks His Holiness to bless the bone of his mother. <laughs> Pasang and Tenzin will have the papers which will allow them to train together at a monastery in the south of India. But Pasang rejects the Dalai Lama's pressure to return to Tibet. I will not go home until Tibet is free. I don't know about my brother. He will make up his own mind when he grows up. The immediate future for Rinchen and Sonam is precarious. If I find work, I'll stay. If I can't find work, I will have to go back to Tibet. If I get a place in a monastery, I will stay. Otherwise, I will have to go back to Tibet also. There is no place for them in Dharamsala. Sonam and Rinchen must take their chances elsewhere in India. Once you've met the Dalai Lama, you forget the hardships of the road. Pema is entitled to only one year's education at the transit school in Dharamsala before she has to return. I cannot go back to Tibet so soon. I want to go back only when Tibet is free. I will never return. I will be able to beg. I don't have any other way of finding money, as I don't know anybody here. 
I will always pray for the freedom of Tibet. Tenzin says he intends to study hard. He wants to return one day to Tibet to see his mother again. Until that day, there can be no contact. I wouldn't tell her how we had to steal food to live. How when we crossed the snow mountains, I got snow blindness. How I cried because I missed my mother so much. How I could hardly walk because my feet were wounded. Pasang and Tenzin are safely installed in the Drepung Monastery in South India. 1,500 miles to the north, the Chinese maintain an iron grip. And every day, their subjects set out again, risking their lives to escape from Tibet. Love.